Well, here's kind of a, a question I have about respiratory protection. I know a big thing for a lot of the people that we deal with is facial hair, right? I have a beard. I don't want to shave it. I have, you know, this amazing goatee that's lovely, right? So how does that kind of fit in with the different types of respiratory protection? Like, is there respiratory protection that can be worn and is effective if you have a beard? There is. It's just going to cost you. That's a challenge. <laughs> Uh, What's your beard worth to you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and this is a fun one because this is something that we hear constantly from end users and clients. Uh, how do I deal with this, right? Whether it's a, a team member that just likes the aesthetics or you have a team member that has a religious belief whereby they're not shaving off their beard and, and that's fine. We can respect that. So what we need to do is understand that when it comes to a proper fit test, especially one done with, you know, a quantitative machine, um, you, you really don't want that facial hair because once you start playing with the seal, it becomes a very slippery slope. So what one employee may have for stubble after a day um, might be suitable. It might get you pants and right. you've done it. We've had it, right? It, it happens. But what about three days after or four days after or five? When does that stubble start to interfere with the seal of the mask? Well, it's really hard to determine, and it's quite personal, right? Some guys uh, generate hair. Some of us are follically challenged. <laughs> Who are you going to be dealing with, right? So from my perspective, clean shaven is always the way to go. So if you're doing uh, a, a fit test, it's got to be clean shaven. And again, there's legislation there to back you up. So if you start getting into that battle, start pulling legislation, it's there. Um, but as far as observing for uh, religious purposes, your best bet is going to be a PAPR or a powered air purifying respirator. Okay. Yeah, we, we get a little bit of pushback from the testing side of things for sure, where, you know, when we book um, fit testing appointments, we always say, make sure you come clean shaven. And we will always get the people who show up with a beard or with a stubble. And yeah, we keep razors and uh, shaving cream here for just that purpose, letting them know. You know, we need you to be clean shaven. And for us, you know, I just really try to explain to them, like, this is for your safety. Like, you're going to be exposed to chemicals, to sour gas, to particulates, to whatever it may be that can have serious, long-lasting impacts on your health. You know, we want to make sure that your mask fits, that it seals, that it protects you. If you've got that facial hair, probably not going to be as effective. No, I mean, you can look as pretty as you want, but if you are <laughs> knocked out due to sour gas or or you're inhaling something that can create an occupational disease. Yeah. <laughs> right. So let's talk cartridges, because this is a question I often get. And it's funny because when we're doing fit testing, cartridges don't really matter. We're not actually filtering for anything. But what do employers need to know about selecting appropriate cartridges for their respiratory equipment? I'm glad you asked that question because it comes up so often. So when it comes to cartridges, it, it, it is a bit of a guessing game, but really it shouldn't be. And what I would encourage any and every employer to do is never, ever, ever guess. And don't take whatever it is that the uh, your distributor is recommending because they shouldn't be recommending anything, quite frankly, when it comes to cartridges. What we need to do to ensure that you have the appropriate level of protection is we need to understand what chemicals or hazards you're dealing with. So there will be some instances where a P100 filter is more than sufficient, especially when it comes to nuisance things like particulate, where, where it can filter it out. But really, if you are playing with a chemical, get a copy of that MSDS mm. and send it off to the manufacturer. Oh, so perfect. 3M, North, Moldex, MSA, you name it. They've all got a uh, chemist on site that will look at those MSDSs and go, hey, wait a second, this is organic vapor. You need an organic vapor cartridge. Perfect. I love that idea of taking the guesswork out, right? Because I think there's a lot of that that goes on or a lot of, you know, thinking we know, oh, I've been in this industry for a really long time. But again, taking that, you know, specific MSDS, sending it and having them match that up, I think is the best way to go. Oh, it's it's wonderful. It's a wonderful service and it, it completely removes that element of error for the most part, unless the chemist is having a bad day. But what it'll be there's a bit of a challenge when it comes to this. Um, I will go back to a, a client and say, oh, based on what you are working with, you might need supplied air. So this could be the challenge. So how much of it, right? That's part of it. But what will end up happening is if 
it's not clear, then you might be pushed into the next category. So, you know, obviously you can start out with an APR. So you're looking at something that filters, right? Right. And then, so, you know, you're stepping up to supplier. So whether that's, you know, a full face mask with a, an airline, you know, using a, a breather box, that's not necessarily the most comfortable, but sometimes it's necessary. And then when it comes to SCBA, I mean, at least with SCBA, you can deal with your IDLH hazards, but you need to understand what you're up against and you need to make sure that you are um, consulting with the right bodies. Absolutely. Well, I think another important part of that is also the worker's health and the worker's medical condition as well, right? Because if you're using, you know, uh, a respirator that's going to require them to suck the air in and have it filtered, if they have some type of lung condition or something that's going to make it hard for them to do that, you know, supplied air may be a better option for them. Well, indeed. And positive pressure is a wonderful thing. I mean, there are some in our industry that will argue that, you know, oh, a fit test is less important when you're playing with positive pressure. <sighs> Let's not go down that road, but you, you might have a point. So positive pressure is positive. It's great to have. But yeah, <laughs> biggest thing is when you're doing that as part of your due diligence and fit testing, making sure that someone is physically able to wear respiratory protection is always critical. And to your point, Chelsea, it is easier to wear a positive pressure system, but we don't want to rely on that. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, you talked a little bit about kind of the importance of looking at the uh, person's medical history there. And you're right. You know, I have a lot of employers that we work with that say, you know, well, we just get the fit test done. And I'm like, the fit test is only one important part here. Great. You know, you know, it's sealed, you know, there's not particles moving in and out. But if the person has some type of medical condition that's going to preclude them from safely wearing it, the fit doesn't matter, right? So it's kind of a two-part system. Make sure that they're physically, psychologically capable of safely wearing a respirator and then make sure it seals and fits properly. Oh, 100%. You absolutely have to make sure that that person's fit for duty. You need to make sure that they have the proper seal. And then the other element to that too is, are we maintaining the respirator? Are we keeping it clean? We're not missing any valves or parts, right? Right. So can you give us some tips or some ideas on how to um, properly maintain our respiratory equipment? As far as properly maintaining it, you want to make sure that you are um, always conducting a negative pressure seal check to make sure that it's fitting properly. That That's part of the maintenance piece for all my components there. You right. want to clean it with wipes or manufacturer specified disinfectant. And every manufacturer has wipes. Many of them have disinfectants. And if they don't necessarily sell a disinfectant, they'll tell you what concentration of, you know, whether you're using bleach or, or alcohol, whatever is permissible, right? So they'll, they'll specify what you can use to clean it. You want to make sure that you're inspecting it. Um, certainly prior to use is always the best plan. Uh, you want to make sure that you're changing out the filters. And if you're storing it, it's advisable to store it in a bag in a clean and dry place. Okay. And make sure that you don't have something sitting on top of it because deforming the mask doesn't help either. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we work with a lot of different um, collection sites and people across Canada and for us here at shift, we always require people to be fit on the respirators that we keep in stock. That way we can ensure that they're properly maintained and they're clean. Cause we have definitely had situations where people will bring in their own respirator and they're filthy and they're warped. And I'm like, this is not the good way, you know, the best way to assess a seal. So I think, yeah, proper maintenance is key. You know, it's all great as well to be fit on a properly maintained respirator, but then to go back and wear your dirty warped mask, you're probably not getting that same fit. Well, there, there's a saying in hockey, as you're probably already aware, <laughs> you uh, play the way you practice. So you need to make sure that you're maintaining all of your gear because when it counts, it's got to be there for you. Exactly. 